sister Helen Riley, and she's going to come, and I ask her to share. She is the founding pastor's wife, and she is part of the foundation, amen? And so I just invited her to come and share a little bit today. Amen. Let's show her how much we love her today. Amen. I told her to just let you have it today. Good morning. It's an honor and a humble privilege to be here today. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful what this church has meant and what it does mean and what it's going to be yet in the future. Great hopes. I know I've got a few pages here, but don't be scared. I can read fast. <laughs> I could... When I was asked to kind of give a little history, I thought, well, dates are boring, but I guess they mean something. And stories, they're okay. But I wanted to bring forth something that is the foundation of this church, and I see that it's still going on. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, those are three words, prayer, the Holy Spirit, and the altar. Those were the most important things to my husband. And I know when he, if he'd have been here this morning, he would have been very pleased with your worship to God. Um, the altar was something that he really focused in on. And as I try to tell a little bit of the story, I hope my desire is that you will go away thinking prayer, the Holy Spirit, the altar. Um, to give you a little background, <laughs> my husband came from the other end of the United States, Texas. I was raised here in the valley. He was from a Christian Pentecostal home. I was not. I was raised in a non-Christian home, but my mom believed in God, at least, and told me in German, Liebe Gott, be straff. That means if you don't behave, God will punish you. That's who I thought he was. Thank God I found different. So Paul's parents had met Jesus before he was born. He had two older brothers. And it was through a neighbors of theirs that they invited him to their house, and they began talking to them about the Bible. And they had some questions, and they said, well, why don't you come with us to church? And the pastor can tell you better. They did. The first night, they got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Knew nothing, but they received. So when Paul was born, his mom, um, he was born at home, never had a birth certificate. We had to prove how old he was somehow. Um, and she never had any pain, nothing when he was born. She was speaking in tongues, and he came. And she always called him. She always called him her Holy Ghost child, her Holy Ghost child. Well, that proved to be true. So somewhere along his life, God directed him to here. Um, I came from the opposite end, like I said. My bus driver was the the one that actually brought me to the Lord. He was also an Assembly of God children's home worker or owner or operator on Fishick in Palmer. And 
some of the kids in that home were my age, and one of the girls invited me over for a weekend. I went, and I was amazed. They prayed at the table. They read the Bible. And I thought, wow, I like this. It wasn't very soon I was going to church with them and received the Lord into my life. Thank God, at the age of 13, what a time to be saved. So time went on. Uh, that bus driver also became our main mentor in building the church. He wasn't afraid to step out on faith at all. So in the summer of 1951, after Paul had spent three years in California at Bible School, Bethany, um, see if I can handle this, <laughs> We started the church, as was told this morning, in the old community hall, the log building. We asked May Carter, who was uh, kind of in charge of the town, and she said, yeah, you can, you can use it. We won't charge you rent, but you'll have to clean up and everything, and uh, it was okay. We weren't born with silver spoons in our mouth, and so that was, that was okay. And people started thinking, hmm, who are these people? I think they're holy rollers. And so as we were using that building, it had a big door on the back. Kids would come, mostly kids. They would come and open the door real quick and yell, holy roller, holy roller, and then shut the door and run. Uh, but, you know, so... The mentor waited for the right time, and he said, as soon as we get $50 in the offering for the building, we will buy a lot and start. So, you know, when you get offerings like $6, $7 a Sunday, you know, it took a little while to get the $50, but they bought the first lot where Teen Challenge Building stands now. The building was a lot of work, of course. Anybody that builds knows that. Uh, so Paul had a few people that did come and help him. Brick Cather, who, are, who was our mentor, was one of the big helpers. But we had another guy come, and he was helping Paul build the foundation. And they were digging, you know, on big rocks and pounding. And finally the guy said, Brother Riley, Brother Riley, Brother Riley. He said, what? He said, you know, if we could just pray these rocks into gold, we wouldn't have to do all this work. We could just have it hired done. You know what his quick answer was? Keep shoveling, Harley. So by this time, some of the townspeople around were noticing us a little more because now we're trying to build a building. And they, one man was known to have said, well, those holy rollers on the hill, they won't be here long. Well, here we are. And uh, by 1953, uh, we began using the basement church. It was pretty crude. It had a top of... Uh, some kind of black tar and stuff, but, and it didn't leak, but you know, you had to go in and make your own benches. It was a cement floor, cement walls, made uh, benches out of some of the boards that were left and set them on a cement block. I have some of you have been there, you know what that is. Anyway, but then you had to, you know, bring, we had to there bring our wood too, like we did at the community hall, so that wasn't new, but, uh, because you built the, the, you know, the wood stove going and it got warm in there, there was condensation. So it would be profitable if you brought your umbrella because the water started dripping from the ceiling. You had, you had to hold your coat over your um, songbook. We used songbooks in those days <laughs> to 
to keep them from getting wet. So the basement then was improved. We had three rooms. One was the kitchen, two were Sunday school rooms, and one large room for the fellowship hall. Easter, we had the first service in the improved building. By 1958, the first service was held upstairs in the chapel that's there now. And by now, um, we had hired a local carpenter to put up the rafters. He was the one that did all the carpentry work in the valley. He built people's caskets if they died, and he built whatever they needed, and so that, you know, that was acceptable. But something was terribly wrong with the rafters. A man in his family started coming to church and said, I can fix that. He did. He came every morning with his lunch pail, worked eight hours, and never Ask for a cent. I know that angels come in different forms, and that time it was in the form of this man and his family, because he wasn't there that long after that. They were gone. But that was a God thing. Then, let's see. Our family, by 1959, moved into the basement in those three rooms. It was an upgrade for us. We had been living on the original colony farm where I was raised in a made-over barn. So my kids weren't born in a barn, but they lived in one. Um, by then, the community had accepted us as part of the community because obviously we were not leaving. We became jack of all trades. My husband worked in the Thielen store. Uh, his mom, who lived here then, was the cook at the school and sometimes the other cook didn't come. She was not fit to come. So we went down and worked in the kitchen to help her. Then um, different little jobs and things came up, school bus driving, and I ended up somewhere along the world doing book work for the Teal and Store. People said, well, seemed like you can do about anything. I said, when are you going to attend bar? We said, no, that's where we draw the line. We're not doing that. Fingers to work. By 1962, we bought the fourth lot, which is on Kinnick and Park Avenue, which is now the sort of the parsonage again for the people running Teen Challenge. Praise the Lord. Again, that was a challenge, and as we were building, ran out of money, and Paul prayed whined a little to God and that he didn't have any funds to go forward. And God said, use what you have and I'll give you more. So he thought, well, there are some boards around and things. I guess I could use them. And right quickly, a man in Anchorage who was a contractor donated windows, doors, cupboards, and so it went. Another miracle of God. Uh, by 1964, I stood firm and said, no Christmas tree unless we move in the parsonage. We did move just before Christmas. Somewhere in those years, Little Beaver Lake was on the start. Again, it was my husband who was the main guy that said yes to the lady that wanted to donate this land out in the swamp way out in the country. And he said, I can see we can do this. So that's where it started, and Beaver Lake became very much part of this church and still is today. Um, we were there to 
do whatever we could during the time, and Paul was the one that brought all the groceries and all this and that, did a little disciplining, shall I say? And uh, so our parsonage, our home, became the hotel for all the speakers that came, the cook and their family that came, all the missionaries that came through, and those were fun, fun years. Okay, so the church kept growing. And somewhere down the road, people were drawn. They, we had a, different, a couple of different families that were just coming by, driving Connick Road. So if you live down Connick Road, watch out. You might get drawn in. And today, I was still in contact with one of those families, at least. But they felt just drawn to come. And so they did. They started coming, and they got saved and lived a Christian life and were a great blessing to the church. By 1977, it was time to add on. The building was no longer big enough to house the congregation. So uh, during that time, uh, it, we, the board decided to just take matters in their own hands and build that big addition on the back, which was extension of the auditorium and office space and lots of Sunday school rooms. During that time, too, Paul looked at the altar and saw lots of women, lots of teenagers, but no men at the altar, hardly any men. And that bothered him, so he began to pray, Lord, send us men. And he did. One morning, he looked out there, and he thought, wow. There's 12 guys out there. That's awesome. The working of the Holy Spirit again. Then, needing more room, things kept growing. This property was bought. A huge step. One of the steps was to try to borrow money. A million dollars, to be exact. So he went to to the local bankers downtown, thinking, well, we've been here a long time. Maybe they'll realize we could do this. And the banker said, how do I know you'll be here? And my husband's reply may be rather rude, but he said, we'll be here when you're gone. Well, the building was built, and that man, that banker, their bank went down, and that man just humbly said, hello, when he met us. Because I think he remembered those words. But God was, God was faithful. So now, it's, uh, even though there was a lots of prayer and anxious moments, it didn't just happen overnight. In 1980, 1980, we had the MAPS team come up, which they're a great, great organization. Don't get me wrong. They are great and still great today. But somehow this man slipped through the cracks. We didn't know it. They didn't know it. But he was just working here during the day and then going down and drinking at the bars all night. Well, that didn't work too well. He made some horrible mistakes, and the back, wall underneath the fellowship hall. To us, it was the wailing wall because he decided, oh, yeah, we can backfill, and the whole thing started falling in and everything like that, and it was a panic. And then we found out the truth and thought, oh, no. What are we going to do? Well, we had some awesome workers that were part of this church that said, no, we got to take this wall down. We've got to build it up, we've got to do, I don't know what all they had to do, but of course we fired the man. He left. But now what to do? Now here, you're in a building and nobody to do it. So Paul called his old friend, Dick Rutledge, who had been a 
missionary and a pastor and a builder here in Alaska. He was a crude builder. He built with the chainsaw, but, you know, he got it done. Uh, <laughs> so he called him and he said, Paul, I wouldn't do this for anybody else, but I'll come and do it for you. And he did. He did a good job, don't you think? Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I told you all I want to tell you. We held the first service in 1981 in the fellowship hall downstairs with the Sunday school rooms and stuff above us. 1982, we held the first service in the main auditorium. And again, it was Easter. We had a thing about Easter. And in 1982, later in July, uh, we had the dedication of this building. Awesome day. The Lord gave Paul the directions even for that date. He showed him a scripture about it should be on the days when the flags are waving, so he determined that must be the 4th of July. Plus, the church was started in July, which would have been 68 years ago this month. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, there have been some major setbacks. But you know what? God is a redeemer. He's a redeemer of lives. He's a redeemer of situations. He's a redeemer. He is a redeemer. That's why he came. And thank God, he sent Pastor Mel and his lovely wife and yeah, his family. And... And I'm so grateful that they were able and willing to answer that call. You know, it takes a call. If God calls you to do something, you best do it. So I guess that's what I wanted to say, mainly, and that. I want you to be sure to remember those three things. Prayer, that was Paul. If you thought of him, you thought of prayer. He preached the word in its fullness, which included the Holy Spirit. And the altar was an important, important part of his life. Um, he had a vision before he passed away about this church. And he saw coming down the aisle a river of blood. And everybody who touched that was healed spiritually, physically, and all, all of that. And so he took that to mean God had big, awesome plans for this house. His Love was to see this place used all the time for not just the congregation, but the community, because it's big enough, and that it would be truly a service to God and the valley. Yes, for the whole valley. He loved the minister's prayer. He would go to that every Thursday if he had to crawl there. I mean, really, because that was his heart, and that's mine. And I know that God's going to answer all those prayers and all those things and all those times. They were not in vain. God has mysterious ways of working. I've been singing a little chorus for months, I guess, to myself. And it goes like this. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. 
Come in your strength. Come in your power. Oh, yes. Come in your own gentle way. May this continue. I'm glad to see it. We love you. Amen. Aren't you thankful for Sister Riley today? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm not going to preach today. I had planned to continue in our fourth commandment today, but I wanted to give Sister Riley all the time that she needed today. But I will say this. As she was speaking, I was reminded of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Pastor Paul and Helen had a vision from God. A vision that was exceedingly abundantly above what most people thought could take place at that time in this community. The banker had his doubts, but we see who won out, amen? And I, and I believe that the Lord's stirring our hearts today to believe Him for greater things. I want to ask you, What are the things in your heart that you can imagine God doing in your life or through your life or in your family? What can you imagine God doing in our church and in our valley and in our state? Because God says to us today, He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But it's according to the Holy Spirit power working in us. It's in direct response to our surrender to God. And and, and we come to Him saying, Lord, I can't do it in my own might, my own power. It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Amen? That's what God told Zerubbabel when he was facing the temple and it wasn't being rebuilt and he he didn't have the support of the people like he needed. What did he do? What did he do? He was frustrated. He was discouraged. He it wasn't being accomplished. And God sent the prophet to him. And the prophet said, Zerubbabel, it's not going to be by your might or your power, but it's going to be by my spirit, saith the Lord. He's saying, God's going to bring it to pass. But he he asked uh, Zerubbabel to do one thing that seemed very strange to him. He said, I want you to shout grace. I want you to shout grace over the temple. Grace in this situation. And what, what he was saying there is when we shout grace, we're saying, God, I can't do it. It's going to take a move of your power and your might by your Holy Spirit. Amen? And, and I I said I wasn't going to preach. <laughs> but church, God has greater things for us. God's done amazing miracles. And Sister Riley shared just a few of those. How God would bring somebody or God would provide the finances. And we're sitting in this beautiful building today. Because they had a vision that came from God. And God was able to do exceedingly abundantly above their vision. That, that, what they imagined in their heart. And I'm so thankful that Pastor Paul was a man of faith. 
He was a man that loved God. He was a man that didn't compromise. He was a man that preached the whole counsel of God. He was a man that believed in the altar. The altar, and we don't have formal altars, but when we talk about the altar, it's coming forward. It's making that step. It's coming to God. And in the Old Testament, an altar was the place where they came for a great exchange. They would come with their difficulties, with whatever they faced, and they would bring it to the Lord. And God would take whatever was going on in their lives, whatever was going on in their hearts, and God would intervene at that place. It's a place of exchange where we say, Lord, I don't want this in my life. I want what you have for my life. Amen. The altar isn't something that's archaic it's in, and it's out of date. The altar is still a principle for every Christian today. We should never be ashamed to come to the altar. Amen. And I love on Sunday nights when, when we have so many guys here. We have Teen Challenge here. A lot of Sunday nights, we have the Dream Center guys, and I'm thankful for the ladies too. We have a lot of ladies too. But we're not a church just made up of children and women. We're a church that's made up of men of God that desire to lead and live for God. And so today as we close, I want the worship team to come. And I'm going to just have you stand with me. And I want to read this verse again. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Whatever you envision right now for your family, for your life, God is able to do far beyond that. This week I was in at, at Teen Challenge for prayer one morning with the leadership, and I asked them this same question. What can you imagine God doing through your life? What can you imagine God doing in, in, in this ministry? And I want to ask you that today. What can you imagine God doing in your life, in your family, through your min, ministry? Because every one of us has a ministry. And my answer is, he can do greater than what you can imagine. I was asked, well, what, well you know, they, they said, well, we're going to pray for you. Now tell us what you can imagine. And I said, well, that's easy. I can imagine a church that's filled four times every Sunday. I can imagine a church that is sold out to God where every person is coming and they're not focused on one another. They're focused on Jesus. I can imagine a church that is filled with people that love God and love one another. I can envision a church where, where we want to impact our city and our state with the kingdom of God. A church that sends people to the north, the south, the east, and the west with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can imagine a church that sends missionaries around the world. I can imagine a church where, where the presence of God is so strong that people cannot wait till the end of the message, but they run down the aisles to the altar. They run to Jesus and they welcome Him to come into their heart and into their life. I can imagine a church where people run down the aisles because they need healing or they need deliverance. Something has them in bondage and they say, God, I'm tired of this. I want to be set free. There's a lot of things I can imagine, and God says, I can do greater things than that. And that's what God's saying to you today. You may be in a situation with a family that's struggling. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe you're struggling financially. Maybe you're having a hard time raising your children, and there's strife in the home. And you say, well, I can imagine a family with peace. I can imagine a marriage where we love one another, and things are just enjoyable. And God says, I can do greater things than that. You may imagine, well, I can imagine having a good job where I can pay all the bills. And God says, I can do greater things than that. You may be here and you may say, I can imagine being set free from alcohol or drugs or pornography or other life-controlling things. And God says, I can do greater things than that.
Church, God wants to do greater things. He wants to move in our valley and move in our state. But we have to be willing and say, Lord, let your Holy Spirit move in me. I surrender to your Spirit. What do you want to do in my life? What do you want to do through my life? That's the church God's called us to be. A church that says yes to the Word, yes to Him, yes to the power of His Spirit working through us to accomplish what He wants to accomplish. There's so many people, thousands of people today that in, our, in our community right around us that do not know Christ as Savior and Lord. There's thousands of people that are living life in bondage to something. There's thousands of homes that are struggling. Thousands of marriages. Thousands of homes where the teenagers are out of control. There's strife in the home. And the answer to everything that I've named is Jesus. It's Jesus. And I want to challenge you today. I want to fulfill Pastor Riley's vision. I want to fulfill that vision. As God leads us and God directs us and God empowers us, I want to see this church accomplish greater things than we can even imagine. In the past, this church has sent out missionaries. It's sent out people to the villages in our state and been a blessing to this state. In the past, this church has trained up children's workers that went and became children's pastors. They've trained up men and women to go out into the villages and go out into other churches in the state and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And church, I want all that and I want more. Amen? Amen? Because God says, I can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. And I want to invite the prayer team to come and I want them to line up here. And we're going to close the service. The last Sunday that Pastor Paul was here with us, before the week that he went to be with Jesus, I remember very distinctly, he was standing right about where Melody is. At this time in the service, And we gave an altar call and people were there and he was praying for people. Still ministering the love and the life of Jesus. He didn't realize it. None of us realized that in a few days he would see Jesus face to face. But that was his heart. With every day that God gave him to continue to minister the love and the life of Jesus. That's what I want to do. And if you're here today and there's something that you're struggling with or there's something that you're imagining God could do so much, I want to invite you to come and pray with one of these on our prayer team today. Before we go, we're not going to take a long time, but I want to believe God. Whatever your need is today, maybe you need a job, maybe you're struggling and you need a better job. Maybe you need God to intervene in your family. Maybe you need deliverance from something. Whatever it is, I want to invite you today. Bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Him. Mitch, would you lead us?